right, so my name is uh, Pontus um, and I'm uh, working for Sectra for roughly 15 years uh, in this business and I just have to start to warn you a bit that um, I see a couple of familiar faces and you will uh, hear a bit of repetition compared to what, what I talked about yesterday about uh, going multiple departments and, and integrating imaging into the EPR. Similar concept today but a slightly different take on it in terms of how we can achieve true clinical value with a VNA architecture. Because I think, uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with Simon Sinek's uh, golden circle. He states the importance of that we, we always focus and step back and, and, and ask ourselves why we're here in the first place. And I think that's a very good proposition whenever we're evaluating uh, technical solutions or, or architectures to, to not get stuck in the technical details uh, but always asking ourselves will this eventually do provide clinical value? If it doesn't, we have failed. We're all here for the patients and that what, that's what really matters. And the, the problem facing those patients today are uh, situations like, like this, where our healthcare systems today are very scattered in the healthcare organizations. The IT infrastructure is quite departmental, split up into different departmental systems. Uh, and, and because of the multitude of systems uh, available, I asked this question yesterday, and I'll try it today as well. Just uh, to, for, for all of you in here, if you know how many IT systems you have in place that stores images of, of some kind in your hospitals. So just wanting to ask, how many of you have consolidated all these systems into one single system? Anyone the two systems? Any with more than five systems? Uh, quite a lot of you nodding. Yeah, that's, that seems to be quite representative for, for what we see today. Um, and some of these uh, departments, un unfortunately, the digital revolution hasn't even reached them yet. They're still uh, analog, or, or they are using digital uh, images, but storing them not in a, in a protected IT system, but on USB sticks or CDs stacked on shelves. And that's, of course, not good. What, when we have all this multitude of, of systems, the problem is that it feels like this for any IT department to manage. It becomes very expensive and laborious, and that means that they start sacrificing things. These departmental systems may not be robust or have the proper high availability solutions required for mission critical uh, work. They may uh, sacrifice security, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, something that will be quite a uh, uh, quite a big of a problem also with interoperability. Connecting all these so everyone in the enterprise has access to all of these systems is simply not feasible. The EPR, which I talked about yesterday, will not be able to link up to all these systems, which is very unfortunate. I think we'll hear more about also integrated diagnostics uh, today and, and the work done to, to facilitate access to multiple types of data both in the diagnostic world as well as in, in, in uh, uh, review and uh, referring physicians. And, and this leads to, unfortunately, a world that still looks like this in, in many of your, your hospitals, I presume, with these departmental systems, that departments are isolated islands of information and unfortunately that doesn't bridge across and, and collaboration between the departments uh, is hindering a good process and, and good clinical value. The patients will ultimately suffer because today we optimize on each department. We don't optimize the entire chain from start to finish on the disease. Obviously you all know uh, that was the main proposition with, uh, with VNA as such to come to the table to solve some of these problems. Some of it being cost driven, uh, purely consolidating the storage and taking the A out of the packs as a separate larger uh, storage. But then also the beauty of, of ingesting other types of content into this, uh, this uh, archive so that we can, we can access that from anywhere in the enterprise, from any device, from anywhere at any time. 
it's a brilliant proposition, and I think that it, it has been hugely successful uh, in in uh, in the marketing and being adopted by the community. Now, I, there there have been some reviews into looking into why these systems were procured in the first place, and I, I want to share in this this talk some of the challenges that we have seen uh, implementing. VNAs uh, and also sometimes struggling to achieve clinical value. Uh, sometimes we have solved the problems of the IT department but introduced new problems for the clinical users and that just cannot happen. But I think one of the challenges, not so much to do with, with the actual end result but the implementation of the project, is a bit ironic. Uh, one of the, the main uh, values that are, are requested uh, when purchasing a VNA is to avoid PAX migration. And, and yesterday there was one gentleman in, in the crowd that had succeeded in, in consolidating all their images. He answered to the question that they had only one system and I asked what was the greatest challenge they had and he said the data migration. So it's a bit ironic that the first thing you have to start with is to, to do the very thing you're trying to avoid. But nonetheless, when you have succeeded and brought it all together, obviously, then you're in a better position. But fact is that the VNA uh, architecture has been so successful that we haven't really been, I think, uh, objective or, or wanting to see the potential problems that it can introduce. And it is way more immature in terms of architecture than the more uh, long-term, longer solutions that have been in play in the market for, for years and years, like risks and packs and so forth. The marketing, I would say, has been so successful and it has followed the Gartner hype cycle quite well. Uh, when a product is first introduced on the market, uh, everyone thinks this is going to be the golden solution to all our problems, excellent, let's buy it. Uh, and everyone's got inflated expectations on what this beautiful thing can do. Uh, I know that in the United States, where the trend of VNA started, uh, they they are now plummeting down this trough of disillusionment. And, and some of them are migrating data back into the PAXs, some are replacing their PAXs with other, or replacing their VNAs with, with other VNAs, hoping that the situation to be better. I am not so sure either of those solutions is sort of the, 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 the way to go, but rather to put the requirements down in the first place when, when procuring VNA to make sure that it follows the clinical values we want. Uh, now, when you do that, I, I s really believe that you can get uh, a solution that, that works in clinical practice, providing both the values of the VNA proposition as well as making sure uh, all the users uh, are, are happy, both in the diagnostic department as well as outside. One big challenge though in this is that, that uh, the world is not as simple implementing this and I, I really want to stress this, that uh, the HL7, DICOM, uh, these standards that have been in play are in play, really important in making things work. Uh, years of IHE connectathons and, and pure evolution has made sure this works in practice, not just in theory. Now, then there are a, a whole truckload of other three letter acronyms out there, often used in the procurement for VNA and for the clinical solutions we were trying to, to implement. And Sometimes I think there's a problem in, in just referring to an acronym. We don't swear ourselves free from responsibility of providing clinical care just by writing that acronym in there. Standards are fantastic and they're great and we should use them to solve our problems whenever we can utilize a standard. But some of these are quite immature. So please remember that when you do that, study the, the, uh, the details of the standards so you know exactly what problems they solve. And also be aware that the interoperability projects implementing this uh, may turn out more costly and lengthy than, than you had anticipated. Uh, take, uh, take in terms of realizing the, the values that we, we're looking at here, uh, one of the challenges, take speed as a as an example, when, when we have um, the, the PAX uh, traditional no VNA architecture to begin with that we had a few years back, uh, the, the user would simply uh, 
click an examination and, and an image and it would pop up on the screen and, and, and that regardless of where it is in the archive. We'd sort of left the, the paradigm of, of, of deferring between long-term or short-term storage. You would have direct streaming ar archive access to anything in the image repository. Uh, now, when we introduce a VNA middleware and make sure that the PAX is connected with the VNA using uh, some standard uh, non-streaming protocol, performance will be imp impacted, no doubt. And, and this can be, whoops, can be, can be a challenge. Um, sorry about that. The, the, um, the performance there of, of speed is uh, uh, also when we look again at, at streaming. So say, say you have um, uh, an archived study uh, that is no longer in the short-term storage uh, of the PACs, and the user sitting in front of the radiology workstation wants to pull up uh, the, the images and perform a 3D volume-rendered uh, image of, of this information. What happens? Well, obviously, we have to uh, pull the entire CT stack from the VNA into the PACs and then start working on the computational stuff to create a 3D image. So that will take longer time and can definitely be a performance problem for the, the clinical users in the radiology department, uh, the radiologists performing the diagnostic work. And, and I see that as a, as, a, as a key problem here. Sometimes uh, we introduce a, a technical framework because we want to solve some of the cost issues and some of the, the sharing issues uh, for the entire enterprise, but if that comes at a cost of, of making the diagnostic work of the radiologists worse, then that's, that's a major issue. Some consultants have uh, attempted to, to uh, divide the VNA proposition into maturity levels. I don't know really if, it's, if, if you can probably slice that cake any way you want, but I think it's, it's quite interesting to see how Herman Ostervik in this case has focused quite a bit also on the on the non-radiology uh, arena to, to say well if you if you can support multiple departments uh, it, or in a or multiple hospitals uh, that's great but then now we int we're introducing photographic information uh, EKGs or ECGs uh, you have uh, spanning different uh, multiple medical record number domains like I know you have here in the UK uh, some, some challenges when it comes to the patient IDs uh, and to, to cross that, cross the bridge uh, for different organizations. There are standards for that but they are, as we said before, they are not plug and play uh, and, and it comes at a huge expense to try and solve that problem. Uh, talking about not plug and play at all uh, if we step outside of the radiology uh, department for a while and think about uh, the types of equipment and the types of systems that we have to hook up if we want to ingest non-DICOM, uh, non-radiology information. Then we're looking at JPEGs, videos, uh, pathology slides, uh, and, and this, this type of equipment definitely will not support uh, the DICOM standard and, and here you have to be aware. You we cannot just say that we support the XDSB standard. Uh, we can utilize that, which is great for storing non-DICOM uh, files. We can keep them in their native format. <clears throat> but uh, just referring to that three-letter acronym doesn't solve the problem. We still don't have a clinical workflow for ingesting that information in a way that makes sense for each of those departments. Uh, in dermatology, ophthalmology, uh, ambulance, uh, uh, etc. We need uh, clinical workflows, uh, usable solutions uh, that, that we can work with. And once when we have that information in the system, then it's necessary that we can, sh we can put it out and back to the users uh, for everyone to look at. And there, there are some significant challenges uh, involved, especially with certain type of data. And that type of data uh, uh, is the, one, the ones that have to utilize streaming technology to be, to be viewed. Uh, if I take digital uh, pathology as an example, whole slide images that are scanned in enormous resolution. Uh, here the, the files, a single image can be say between half and one gigabyte. 
uh, and streaming that over to, to a computer, taking the, the entire file and downloading it to a computer, that will take a very long time. So therefore, here we can utilize streaming technology because the pathologist will only look at, say, 1% of the data. They will zoom in. In this case, this is a 20 times magnification of the image. It's very hard to see, but up here, uh, it's zoomed into something that looks like it's one pixel on the overview uh, image but it's, it's really a, a high resolution image. But here we can download, say, 10 megabytes to the workstation with really good performance. Uh, and we can do that despite the fact that the file sitting in the archive is one gigabyte large. So think about that when you, when you implement your universal viewers or your, your uh, direct connections between diagnostic systems and your VNAs to make sure that, that you, you uh, allow streaming technologies. And the same uh, holds true for, for video. If you record four hours worth of uh, open cardi cardiac surgery, for example, and you find something happening really interesting in the middle, and you insert a bookmark or some sort of pointer into that, that, that video file, I don't think the users would be really happy if they had to download the entire four hours worth of uh, surgery just to watch those 10 seconds of interest in the middle. <coughs> YouTube and similar consumer products, they, they set the benchmark here. That's what the clinicians will demand in terms of performance. And you need to be able to skip into, into the middle of a video file to look at it. And that's only possible if we can adhere to streaming technologies as well. So, so beware of that as well. And now, ingesting data from these other departments, then we're starting to look at, say, A&E, uh, dermatology, uh, I know in, in a project that we have in Norway, uh, a fifth of the country of Norway procured a, a solution for enterprise uh, imaging and uh, they are now recording psychology interviews. And uh, I think when, when looking at uh, uh, the types of content that we ingest now for, from, from these type of departments, they are far more explicit also in material compared to a, a chest x-ray. Now here we're looking at say abuse victim documentation, forensic material, we're looking at nudity, perhaps and the, these psychology interviews obviously very sensitive material. And uh, because of this we have to have access control, access restrictions in play. Uh, if, if we just uh, access all this information through the DICOM interface, well, then anyone can ask a DICOM query to the, to the port and get anything back. That, ne that needs to be stopped. Uh, it it's cannot happen that these types of, uh, of images leak out to any other system or that everybody uh, in the entire healthcare enterprise can access this. Obviously, that needs to be the ones that are authorized and where it's relevant to that patient's clinical pathway. Another challenge in, in implementing uh, a VNA to achieve uh, really good clinical value is to link back to the EPR system. That was sort of the main uh, concept of, of my talk yesterday that if we don't uh, provide this link, it means that the clinical users outside of the diagnostic departments, they will not even know if something exists. If we have ingested uh, photos or, or PDF files or Word documents or any type of multimedia, then we need to ensure that the EPR system is alerted of that. They get a content notification. And, and by doing that, the, the EPR system can then uh, embed a viewer inside their user interface to show the images or provide a link so we click it and then that fires up the universal viewer uh, of, of some sort to, to show this content. So think about making sure that if you have a VNA implementation that you make sure that any ingested content is also uh, notified to the EPR. In one of the, also I think, uh, challenges is the universal viewer uh, as, as such. The proposition with VNA uh, to ingest everything in one big bit bucket and then provide a universal viewer for all the uh, people outside the diagnostic spheres. Obviously, we still, mind you, keep 
the, the, the best of breed approach on the departmental level to, uh, for diagnostic purposes, but now we have a viewer for enterprise access to, to the content. Here it's a bit of a worry. Uh, I, I, we have um, uh, quite a bunch of uh, cognition scientists in our development team at Sectra. They are uh, the people that are experts in user interaction and user interface design. And uh, they get this sort of nervous rash whenever I use the word universal, because they say, well, if, if I design it for, for no one, it's going to fit no one. Uh, then it's not going to be purpose built for any workflow. Uh, and that could very well be a danger. So what, what's, what my advice would be is to ensure that you know your use cases for your universal viewer. Uh, think about why does it exist? What is it going to be used for? What workflows, what, what uh, work streams will it be involved in? And make sure it works really well for that. That, that you have a coherent use of that product. Because I think if we are to solve the challenge that we stand in front when it comes to the, the healthcare system, I don't know what the NHS financial gap is today, but I've heard it's absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, it's a huge challenge for healthcare, and if this is going to be uh, addressed in any way, I, the only way I can think of that happening is if we actually optimize the entire process for the patient to actually start being true about what we're talking about when we say that we're patient-centric and, and optimize the chain for the patient and not for the departments. If we say, yes, excellent, the patient's been, been in and we, and in our department, we've done our job in 45 seconds, great. Well, if the patient had to wait for two weeks until they went to the next department, we have failed. I think we need to optimize there for the patient so we get better outcomes in, uh, in, in less time. Take uh, the multidisciplinary team as an example. I think this is uh, a, a workflow that you have that, is, that has grown in importance, which is enormously successful. This is where all the different types of physicians gather up together with their different perspectives and talk and collaborate and truly uh, build a richer view of the patient to be able to make informed decisions and to be able to, to uh, reach this better outcome for the patient quicker. And I think here, I urge you when you look at use cases for your universal viewers to ensure that it supports this type of uh, process. If, if you are stuffing everything into one system, but be sure that you can have prepared uh, uh, displays where you have laid out all these different images, the pathology images, the photographic images, the videos and the radiology images, and that you can save that so in the MDT meeting you save everybody's time. Obviously an MDT meeting with all the, the high profile people in that room will be a very expensive uh, meeting and, and, and we don't want that to take longer time than necessary. But I think when it comes to the challenge of, of creating good clinical value, the, uh, one of the, the challenges involved in the VNA proposition as such is the, uh, that, it's, that it's somehow uh, going towards one, of the end, one end of the extremes in terms of best of breed. I think you can take any, any design any architecture of software and start modularizing it, cutting it up into pieces and buying each piece from, from whomever you think is the best of breed. And uh, as long as you start dividing, at some point, uh, the tipping point will exist where the interoperability problems you get from, from all these different modules purchased from different vendors, when that will overshadow uh, the clinical use, the, the actual value that the end users will get from this. Even if it's a beautiful picture on a, on a diagram, it may not uh, necessarily work uh, in, in practice. And I think on the other end of this extreme scale, you have the, the, the best of suites. Let's go buy everything from one single vendor. And I think that that's, that's creating other problems. <laughs> 
We're solving some of the problems with best of breed, but we're creating completely different problems with uh, endless politics, uh, compromises that make no one happy, uh, and uh, th that's probably not where we want to be either. Uh, here, I think in the UK, you've probably been through this probably more so than anyone, uh, any country in the world with your LSP contract. But uh, I think that the, the challenge really to provide clinical value and good performance and making sure we have workflow, work lists across the entire organization, uh, I believe is to somehow find a balance in this, to, to not be on either end of this scale. And uh, if you look at finding the, that sort of balance, I think what we can do is to look at the, the V&A architecture and try and select, well, can we sort of take the majority of, of, the, of the workflow, the most important workflow of, of the system, of the hospitals, and, and make sure that works really, really well. And I think if we were to change this, uh, this picture of the V&A design with the different departmental solutions linked in, I think uh, we, we can see where those 80% exist simply by, by changing uh, the view of this to, to display what are the, the, the sizes of the different, uh, different departments. And bear in mind also, I don't know uh, how many are radiologists in this room. Uh, I, I think I, I urge you to, to step up here and demand uh, the, a, a very good workflow and making sure that your uh, daily job is not impacted to the worst just because we imp implement a new design of the architecture. And uh, I, I think uh, one, one way of doing that is simply to procure uh, radiology systems and VNA together. Uh, because when you procure a VNA, it is very, very difficult to demand in the tender specification that the radiologist should have the image on the display within three seconds. You remember that good old uh, requirement that was in all the tenders. That's not possible. You cannot say that in a, ven in a v &A, uh, procurement. But if you, if you buy the radiology system together with the v &A, then you can. You can say, well, this, this uh, prime contractor have to ensure that I have that sort of performance. And you can create requirements on clinical value and workflows. If that means that you have to run proprietary protocols or whatever, it doesn't matter because then you, you have demanded a solution from, from one single contractor. If, if th that turns out to be uh, a V-enabling of your packs to, to put the modules for, for being a more open and more standards compliant solution, or whether it is a separate system, it uh, doesn't matter either. Uh, then you have required uh, technical functional uh, uh, values together with making sure that the communication between the radiologists and the referring physician is streamlined. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Um, Pascal, come round here. Uh, I'd like to open up to the floor. I, I think questions would be great. And I'm sure you'd appreciate some. Nicola. If somebody comes along to you at Sector and says, um, OK, so what is the value of having a PAX at all nowadays? You should just have this um, VNA and a viewer. How do you, as a major vendor of PAX, answer them? Well, I, I think today we, we, we clearly see just at, at, at the moment that the proposition for, for VNA with the simple viewer attached to it, or simple, it may have to be obviously quite advanced, uh, still does not provide that level of workflow of, uh, uh, of yeah, communication. Can you be, can you be yeah. specific? What level of, which level of workflow in particular? Uh, well, the, uh, the major, I would say, uh, problem today with having uh, a VNA underneath and then only a viewer on top that is sort of stateless, is that uh, the, the VNA will keep content only. It will be uh, a, a bucket of, of data for, of the different images that we have from, say, radiology as an example. Uh, and the viewer can, of, of course, view this, but it doesn't have means of communication uh, between, say, the referring physicians and others. It doesn't have 
the, the reporting capabilities or the chatting capabilities or really seriously linking up referring physicians uh, with, with the diagnostic departments and, and providing uh, work lists that, that, that are common ground, for example, for the MDT, for the clinicians outside radiology to be able to say, I want to talk about this uh, case at MDT, the radiologists providing their details and everyone working together. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I'm surprised you chose those examples. I can think of many examples, but I wouldn't particularly have chosen those. I mean, I would have said the fact that you do not have the software as a radiologist to have folders, to have display bookmarks, to store things for DDPs, to put away uh, image uh, cases for a teaching library. All those sorts of things are not provided by a viewer. But uh... Exactly, and, and I think that that is the... Uh, the core problem that the the data model of the VNA, at least not today, does not support storing those type of objects or those type of data uh, items uh, in a standardized way. I guess the, the standards are pushing in that direction to try and solve some of those problems, but we are nowhere close to that today. i, I just make a comment. Um, I agree with Nicola. I think the challenge for PAX providers is to show that by their close collaboration and relationship with radiologists and people doing the reporting is that they understand all their needs and that their system bends over backwards to facilitate those so that they can concentrate on the diagnostic process rather than everything else that's associated with it. So it's only by that close collaboration and understanding and facilitation of all the multiple needs that radiologists have that you can add value because the bigger picture will be, oh, a single universal viewer will do everyone. Radiologists, please conform. And that's something that we would really have to fight against because what we do is complicated and needs a lot of complex software support. But that's where the added value comes in. I fully agree there. I think the, uh, today the universal viewer aspect is, uh, and that's what I try to show with this featureitis curve, that I think that the problem is today it, it is nowhere close to so serving uh, the, the diagnostic needs of the radiologists uh, at all. Uh, but the problem is, uh, I don't even know whether it's purpose-built to solve the problems of the other people either. Uh, and, and that's something I think needs to be addressed as well. Yes, just on that topic again, um, yes, the, the, you've said it yourself about the, the featureitis. If you make the universal viewer good enough to satisfy the demands of the most demanding image reviewers, then you make it unfriendly to everybody else who's wishing to use it and also presumably hugely boost the cost of the software and the hardware required to use it. I, I, that, that's a, also a very good uh, reason, yes, definitely, for why departmental solutions will be kept in play and, and a best of breed approach does make sense uh, on a departmental level. Uh, I think to, to try to uh, stuff all the different imaging tools into one single piece of software uh, simply will never fly. One of the things I think that we found difficult was the where you come ac across a use case and you then try and spread that across multiple vendors and everybody says I can do my little bit. And I think that was a really hard piece that we had to work with. And how you tie that together is quite, quite complex. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the entire community, I think uh, customers as well as vendors have underestimated the, uh, the interoperability uh, difficulties or challenges that we get with this design. Uh, previously with, with a, a radiology packs, a, a silo, it was uh, n sort of the vendor's problem to sort that out and, and there was no one to point fingers at if things did not work. But today if we're splitting it up, you can end up in a position where, uh, where it becomes a blame game and, and no one really knows whose fault it is. So, so I, I think that's, that's one of the challenges that we see. Yeah. By making one vendor responsible, and, and therefore, as the user, you are not responsible. Now, if I could just uh, make a, one more point, you alluded to the fact that you could have best of breed, or you could, um, 
you know, have sort of one vendor um, and have one throat to choke, uh, as you so nicely put it. But um, I would just caution people that that is not necessarily the case. And some of you will know that I speak from extremely bitter experience with dealing with one particular company. And in fact, their risks and their packs is made by effectively two completely different companies although under the same brand, uh, and they don't understand how each of them works, and more than that, are not in the slightest bit interested, and they don't integrate, etc., etc. So just because you get one brand name doesn't mean the thing's going to hang together at all. And in order to choke that throat, it can take you years and years and evidence that has to be meticulously put down. Uh, and therefore, in the beginning, you do have to make one vendor responsible. So that if the radiologist at the end of the line, and we, I mean, I'm from London, and I know that there are a number of projects out there at the moment that are faltering, simply because they are not, one company is not being held to account, even though it's in the contract. And therefore, you know, if it's the risk company that's to blame, but the PAX vendor or whoever, or the VNA vendor has been made responsible, they have to take on that responsibility and be made to with penalties. I mean, I'm sorry if that sounds... But it is not the radiologist or the NHS healthcare worker's responsibility. No, I, exactly. I, I, and I, I think that, that was what I was trying to allude to with, with this picture. That uh, oh, with with this picture, that uh, uh, by buying this piece of the pie from one vendor, then as you say, then you can have one throat to choke on that, and even. Uh, potentially having one. Actually, a conglomerate of different vendors who remain effectively separate and never speak to each other. So just because they've got one name on the brand doesn't mean that they're going to work together in any way whatsoever. I mean, that may be, and I believe it is actually an exception for the sector, to be fair, because, um, uh, you know, they do tend to make all the products they sell in general or at least take responsibility for them, but that is not true of many other vendors. <laughs> Yeah, that, that may be. I think the, the point here that I tried to make also with the, it's difficult to see, but the, the fatter blue arrows are, uh, as you, what you're saying is that the systems must hang together uh, more, more practically as well, not just be uh, two different companies sourced under one umbrella, but, but rather something that uh, may be within one company or at least some technical solution that hangs together more tightly than just saying, uh, well, let's point to this three-letter acronym and do WADO streaming and then we're happy. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Pontus. Thank really you. Good for a start of the morning. <clears throat>